Thank you. Um, like Katie said, I uh, went to Southwestern. I went here from 2016 to 2020. So I graduated in May of 2020. I was a part of FCA. Um, I also worked for Anna uh, in Sierra. Um, I played basketball for three years. Um, but yeah, I love Southwestern. I'm always grateful for the opportunity to come and talk to all of you. Um, because I, I, I know how important FCA was to me. Um, so I, I take it as a blessing to come have the opportunity to talk to you guys. But um, where we will be today is 2 Corinthians 3.18. So I'll give you a moment to turn there if you would. And the verse is, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, when we become Christians, we turn from our sin to Christ. It's called repentance. And we trust in, in Jesus Christ for our salvation. So that's faith. So faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. When, at that moment, we put our faith in, in Christ, in God's courtroom, he declares us just. So, in his sight, we are, we are just. We are, we are righteous. Um, and we are righteous because Christ's righteousness, what he accomplished for us, is credited to our account, just as our sins and our unrighteousness were credited to his account. Right? So that's, that's that exchange that allows um, uh, for our salvation. But uh, Martin Luther, who you may have heard, he had this famous phrase, um, and he, he said, We are simul justus et peccator which is Latin for simultaneously just and sinner. So what he was getting at is that in God's sight, we are just because Christ's righteousness has been credited to us. But we all recognize that in our Christian lives, we sin every single day, right? This is just the reality of becoming a Christian. And so the goal of the Christian life is to conform our actual outward actions, our, our righteousness in this life, more and more to where we stand before God, right? And so our goal is to become more and more righteous, more and more holy. And the question is, how do we do that? And so I'm sure you've heard, read your Bible, go to church, uh, get baptized, take the Lord's Supper, pray, all of which are, it's all very good advice. Um, but the question I want to ask is, what is actually going on when we do those things? So. When we read our Bibles and when we pray, like what is going on that is that is changing us, um, that is that is making us more righteous and making us more like Christ. And so, um, using this text, Second Corinthians three eighteen, I'm going to walk through three things. So the first is how we are being transformed. Second is into what we are being transformed, and the third is who is transforming us. Right, so how, into what, and who. All right, so the first one, how we are being transformed. So if you look at the verse, um, you can see that the subject, going back to our English grammar, is we all. So Paul here, referencing back to the beginning of the letter, where he uh, addresses um, in verse 1, to the church of God, to the church of God, who uh, that is at Corinth with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia. So Paul here is extending from that very the very beginning of the, the letter. He's saying that the subject here, the we all, is all Christians. So he's he's saying we all possess it, um, all Christians, and the we all are beholding the glory of the Lord, and they're doing that beholding with an unveiled face. And through that beholding, they're being transformed, right? And so what Christians are doing to be transformed is they're beholding the glory of the Lord. And that beholding is done with an unveiled face, okay? So basically, to behold is just to see, to know, to apprehend, just to grasp, right? And so um, what is being grasped, according to Paul in this verse, is the glory of the Lord, and God's glory, essentially, is the shining forth or the brightness of God's holiness. God's holiness 
is, um, as R.C. Sproul put it, it's his, his transcendent separateness. It's all that makes God God. It's God's Godness. It's, it's, it's what God, it's who God is, right? It's, it's what defines God. Um, and so uh, in Isaiah 6, the seraphim who are in heaven before the throne of God, they cry out, holy, they cry out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so you can see that relationship there where God is holy and the whole earth is full of his glory. So just like the sun, right, the, the, uh, the sun's rays show forth like the brightness and the heat of the sun itself. So God's glory shows forth his holiness. Okay. So just want to establish that's what, that's what God's glory is. Okay. Um, and, and so that is what Christians are beholding. Uh, in order to be transformed. So, um, but also remember that qualifier with unveiled face. So Paul here is is referencing um, something else, and so we want to jump back a little bit to verse twelve. And he says, "Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze." at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. And so what Paul is referencing here is Exodus 34. And what happened in Exodus 34 is Moses went up Mount Sinai and he met with God. And he asked God, can I, can I see your glory? God says, you cannot see my glory for no man can see me live. But God showed, he says, you can see my goodness. So he basically saw him, showed him a part of his glory. And also on the mountain, God initiated with Moses the Old Covenant. So this was God's covenant with the Israelites, and Moses was acting as the head on behalf of the Israelites, right? So Moses comes down from the mountain, and everyone's freaked out because Moses' face is glowing. Like, it's, it's, it's shining, and everyone's freaked out by it. Um, and, but Moses goes, goes ahead, and he delivers to them all that God had told, them, told him on the mountain. So he delivers the covenant, um, all that was required of them. And then it says after, the text in Exodus 34 says that after that, Moses put a veil over his face. And so the, the, the text doesn't actually tell us why Moses put a veil over his face. Um, and I think the initial reaction we were like, why did Moses do that, is that Moses, he didn't want to freak the Israelites out, right? He just he wanted to cover his face up because it was glowing. Um, God's glory has made, had made his face glow. Moses didn't want to freak him out, so he put a veil over his face so that they wouldn't be freaked out. But Paul actually gives us a different interpretation, right? And so Paul's interpretation, which we read in verse 13, is that it says, Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. So what Paul is saying actually happened with why Moses put the veil over his face is because he didn't want them to see that the brightness of his face was actually coming, it was dimming. Um, the brightness was, was fading. And the reason why this is really significant is because the brightness corresponds to the, the covenant that Moses made with God on the mountain. And so what Paul is saying is that Moses didn't want the Israelites to see uh, the brightness on his face fading because they would be seeing that the old covenant would be fading and coming to an end. There's that correspondence there. And so Paul then extends this metaphor in verse 14. And he says, But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. And so, just like the veil that Moses wore prevented um, uh, the Israelites from seeing that the Old Covenant was fading away, so, Paul is saying, there's a veil over people's hearts 
that prevents them from seeing that the old covenant has filled, uh, faded away. The veil that uh, doesn't allow them to see that the old covenant has faded away is a veil that prevents them from seeing Christ. And so the significance of that is that when you, when you see Christ, then you, you recognize that the old covenant has faded away. And the reason you recognize that is because Christ was the initiator of a new covenant. And that new covenant, which, which Christ said was in his blood at the, uh, at the, uh, the Last Supper, um, is um, superseded or fulfilled that old covenant. And so, well, what does that all mean? This, this all ties back to the glory of God because of, let me jump back a little further to verse 10. It says, Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all. So what once had, had glory is the old covenant has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it, which is the new covenant. And so the old covenant had glory, but it was like glory like a candle in the sunlight. Like it just doesn't even compare. And the reason it doesn't compare is because the new covenant has Christ. And, and, and so the glory of God lies most fully in the new covenant where Christ is. And so if you want to see the glory of God, you have to see Christ. You, you, what Paul's saying is that like, if you don't see Christ as a spiritual seeing, I'm not talking like uh, physically eyes, but like a spiritual seeing with your spiritual eyes, the eyes of your heart, like Paul calls them in, in Ephesians 1. If you don't see Christ with your spiritual eyes, then you don't see God's glory, which means you don't see God because God's glory is the shining form of who God is himself. And so, if we look at our verse, remember that we have to see God with an unveiled face in order to be transformed. And so that means that we have to see God in Christ to be transformed. So how are we being transformed? Point number one, we're being transformed by beholding the glory of the Lord, and we behold the glory of the Lord by seeing and beholding Christ. So that's point one. Um, and so, we've seen that to be changed, right? We have to behold God's glory, um, and then beholding that glory changes us. But the second point is into what we are being transformed. Um, and I've, I've kind of indicated already that that unveiled face qualifier uh, indicates that what we're being transformed to is actually into the image of, of Christ. And the reason for that is if you look back at verse 18, it says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. That same image, that same image corresponds to the glory of the Lord. And so if we're beholding the glory of the Lord, if the glory of the Lord is in Christ, that means we are being transformed into the image of Christ. But I just want to drive home this point um, a little bit more. So if you jump ahead now to 2 Corinthians 4, 6, you'll see, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, in the face of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, you can see here that Paul is saying, if you look in Jesus' face, again, with spiritual eyes, you're seeing the glory of the Lord. And so, um, there's just that, that emphasis, again, of the glory of the Lord is, is seen in Christ. And um, you can compare this to 2 Corinthians 4, 4, so a couple verses earlier, it says, in their case, the God of the world has blinded the minds of the unbeliever to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so Paul is comparing unbelievers and believers. And what he's saying, the difference between them is, is that one sees Christ for who he is, and the other does not. The unbeliever does it. They're blind. They have that veil. However, there's just different ways of saying it. They're, they don't see, but the believer does see. And because the believer does see, they have that light, and um, therefore they, they know God. And so 
to essentially, again, to behold Christ is to behold who God is. And this is shown clearly in the rest of just the New Testament scriptures. Um, and I just want to drive this home um, because I, I, it's so important to see. So in Colossians 1.15, Paul says he, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. So Jesus is a visible picture on display of who the invisible God is. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews 1.3 says, He, that is Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. Here we see that Jesus shines or radiates the glory uh, of God in his exact imprint of the invisible God's nature, just like if you stuck your hand in wet concrete and you can see the outline of your hand there. And that's just like how Christ shows forth um, the glory of God. John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father. So again, the glory of the Son is from, from the Father. And most clearly is Jesus' words in John 14.9. Anyone, Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So, just like Paul told us, the glory of God is in the face of Jesus, and we're transformed by looking at Jesus and Paul tells us that we're transformed into the same image of what we behold. So we become more and more like Jesus. So what we are being transformed into is um, the image of Christ. And so I want to just draw your attention to uh, a common theme in the New Testament uh, that commonly the moral commandments in the New Testament, so calls to being righteous and holy, are directly tied to calls to be conformed to Christ's image. So basically, in other words, when, when the Bible's commanding you to be more peaceful or loving or righteous, holy, it's, it's telling you to become more like, like Christ. Um, I'll just give you a couple examples. So Peter, in 1 Peter 2.21, says, for you have been called to this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Paul, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, says, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. John, 1 John 2.6, the one who says he abides in him, that is Jesus, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And then Jesus himself in John 13.34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So, when you read an imperative or a command in the New Testament to be more holy, to be more righteous, uh, your mind should immediately make the connection between that and in Christ, and being more like Christ. So, whenever you see anything that's telling you to do something, it's, it's telling you to be more like Christ because he is the one into whose image we are being formed. Um, but the process also works in the opposite direction. So when you behold Christ, you become more like him. But when you behold that which is against Christ, against God, you actually become more like that. So you become like what you behold. Um, and so there's this interesting portion of Psalm 115, uh, verses 4 through 8. It says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. And so those that were making these physical idols, right, what, what the author of the psalm is saying is that they, they, were, they were literally becoming like them. They were becoming mute and deaf and numb, blind, to spiritual realities. Their hearts were becoming like the stone and the wood that they were making, they were crafting those, those idols out of. Because they were, they were beholding them, they were focusing on them, and, and so they were becoming more and more like them. We become like what we behold. Um, and so, just to apply this to our modern context, 
you are becoming like what you behold on YouTube and the internet and social media, Spotify, all of those things, you're becoming like them. Like th this is just a, a reality of, of how God has created the world. We become like what we behold. Um, this should always be on our minds. And so this leads us to my uh, final point. So we've seen how we're transformed, we've seen into what we are being transformed. Um, the final point is who is transforming us. So all that I've said, I do not want to give the impression that you're supposed to will yourself to being better. You're going you're gonna to pick yourself by your bootstraps and you're going to be better. You're going to be more like Christ. Um, because it's, it's just, that's not the case. Um, and we can go back to our, our original text. I'll read it again. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. So that verb tense is important. Um, it's, it's a verb tense that indicates being acted upon, right? So like, um, someone is being killed. It's not implying that they're, they're killing themselves. It's, it's implying that there's some outside force acting upon that, that person. And so we all have a force acting upon us, if we are Christians, that is transforming us into the, the image of Christ. And Paul tells us what that is, um, or who that is, rather. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who is working in our hearts to transform us more and more into Christ's image. Um, and, and we cannot do this on our own. So if you jump back ahead to uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, it says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so what, what Paul is talking about here is um, conversion, like we talked about earlier, a believer. And he's saying that the believer, then becoming a believer, is, is similar to that unilateral act that God did to create light. He, he God, if God didn't say, let there be light, there would be no light. And similarly, there would be no light in our dark, sinful hearts unless God said, let there be light in, in our hearts. And so, uh, again, Paul is emphasizing that this is not something that we do on our own. And like we talked about earlier, again, you contrast this with verse 4, which says, in, case, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So, again, if there's not that act of God to shine lights in our hearts, um, we're left on our own, um, and we're left in our, in our sins. And this contrast of light and dark um, in believers and unbelievers is, is a, a, another common uh, New Testament theme. So, in Ephesians 1.18, Paul prays that the believers would have the eyes of their hearts enlightened. Light, right? He, he, was, he was praying that they would see the light, um, like we've seen, of, of, of God's glory. And that glory is found in Christ. But he also says in Romans 1.21 that those who do not honor God become futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts are darkened. And so believers have hearts that see. They see the light of, of Christ's glory, while unbelievers are, are dark. Their hearts are dark. Um, and, and all of this is just to emphasize that apart from the working of the Holy Spirit, we are without hope. And so in our striving to become um, more and more like Christ, we must depend more and more ultimately on the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see more and more who uh, Christ is, that we may become more and more like him. Um, and so ultimately, this process of beholding more and more of who Christ is and therefore becoming more and more like him is our lifelong process. Um, and then at the resurrection, 1 John, or John says in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is.
And so, at the resurrection, when Christ returns, this process of slowly becoming more and more like Christ, slowly more and more seeing him more and more clearly, the lights will be fully turned on. And because the lights are fully turned on, we will now be perfectly like him. And that is why we will not sin, because we will see him as he is, and therefore we will become perfectly like him. It won't be like it is now, where it's dim, but the light will be all the way on, because of that, uh, we will be made um, just like him. And so, you can see those three points, how we're being transformed, into what we're being transformed, and who's transforming us. And so, I don't want to keep this out in the, the ether, so I, I want to try it in here with a, um, uh, an actual application. So, um, I want to discuss a sin that um, is often left in the dark, and like we talked about, we want light. So, I want to talk about a sin that I'm, sh I'm basically 100% confident that there are people in this room struggling with, which is uh, pornography. And I, I want to apply some of the principles we learned. So, you become like what you behold. So, when you watch pornography, you are becoming more and more like that. You're becoming more lustful and cruel and hard and numb. Um, and it's a harsh reality, but it's true. It, it, like, again, this is, this is a, a, a universal truth. We become like what we behold. And so every, every video is becoming, making us more and more like what we're watching. Um, and I'm sure that many of you um, have tried to stop, um, tried superficial helps, like uh, cutting off inner, or like blocking certain websites, things like that. Um, you may have found that it doesn't actually address the problem. You still struggle with it. Um, and the reason is because you have not killed the sin at the root. And the reason is because you have these dark, dingy corners of your heart where the light of the glory of Christ does not shine uh, shined in it. Um, and so the way you, you overcome uh, pornography or, or any other sin is, is not by just willing harder uh, or, or anything like that, but you have to become more and more satisfied in Christ so that, that those videos no longer have a pool, uh, any pull. And so uh, there's a proverb. The sated man loathes even honey, but to the starving man, even that which is bitter becomes sweet. And what that means is that when, when, you're, when you're full, when you're satisfied, it's like Thanksgiving, like, I can't have any more. I don't, want, I don't even want the, the best tasting, whatever your favorite thing is, cobbler or pie. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm full, I'm satisfied. That isn't appealing to me. But when you're starving, people that are starving, they eat out of the dumpster. And, and, and so, in order to overcome your sins, you have to become more and more satisfied in the, uh, the source that will, will never run out, the, the uh, the ever-flowing fountain uh, of living waters, who is Christ. And so my appeal to you um, who are struggling with this is to look to Christ. And, and there, there are means that are important and things like that, but look to him, cut it at the root. Um, and some of you may not struggle with that sin, but the... Uh, the principle still goes for whatever sin you struggle with is that you have to become satisfied. You do not become satisfied in Christ by beholding his glory and being transformed more and more into his image. Um, then you will, you will go the opposite direction and become more and more like whatever else you behold. Um, and so I'll finish up um, with one last quotation uh, from from John Calvin that I think sums this all up uh, really well. So, we see that our whole salvation and all its parts are comprehended in Christ. We should therefore take care not to derive 
the least portion of it from anywhere else. If we seek salvation, we are taught by the very name of Jesus that is of him. If we seek any other gifts of the Spirit, they will be found in his anointing. If we seek strength, it lies in his dominion. If, if purity, in his conception. If gentleness, it appears in his birth. For by his birth, he, has made, he was made like us in all respects, that he might learn to feel our pain. If we seek redemption, it lies in his passion. If acquittal, in his condemnation. If remission of the curse, in his cross. If satisfaction, in his sacrifice. If purification in his blood, oh, excuse me, if, if purification in his blood, if reconciliation in his descent into hell, if mortification of the flesh in his tomb, if newness of life in his resurrection, if immortal, immortality in the same, if inheritance of the heavenly kingdom in his entrance into heaven, if untroubled expectation of judgment and the power given to him to judge, in short, since rich store of every kind of good abounds in him, let us drink our fill from this fountain and from no other. Um, and so, indeed, may we all drink more and more from the fountain of, of Christ and find um, that ever-flowing grace and forgiveness um, in him. So let me... Father, I, I thank you that you have, um, purely out of love and, and uh, grace and condescension, uh, shown us Christ, um, because in him, in no other name under heaven, um, can man be saved. And um, I pray that for all of us uh, here who, who grow weary um, with our, our sins, and who uh, feel helpless and, and hopeless um, to our, our flesh that abides in us. Um, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would shine that light um, in our hearts, um, because ultimately you, uh, God, who created all things um, and said, let there be light, and there was, um, you are the one who uh, can change our, our dark, um, sinful hearts and, and make them like Christ. And ultimately, we thank you that um, you will, at the resurrection, we will be made um, like him because we will see him uh, like he is. I'm uh, so grateful that you have allowed us to see him. Um, and I pray that all the more uh, we would see what a privilege that is. Uh, make us more like Christ. For those of us um, who are struggling with lots of, of guilt and shame. Um, I pray that the, uh, the Savior of our souls um, would console them, um, convict them of their sins, and, and grant repentance um, that we may have ever-growing communion with you, because that is our goal and our end. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.